reading from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Psalm 31, to the choir master, a psalm of David. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net they have hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love, because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul, and you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. Because of all my adversaries I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbours and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel, for I hear the whispering of many, terror on every side, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O God. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. O Lord, let me not be put to shame, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them go silently to Sheol. Let the lying lips be mute, which speak insolently against the righteous in pride and contempt. O oh, how abundant is your goodness! which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you in the sight of the children of mankind. In the cover of your presence you hide them from the plots of men. You store them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was in a besieged city. I had said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight but you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. Love the Lord, all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repairs the one who acts in pride. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. Good morning. This morning we come to 1 Peter 1 verses 10 to 12. We're looking at the things into which angels long to look. Verses 3 to 4 form one long run-on sentence in Greek in three parts. There is the landscape. If you remember verses 3 to 5, rehearse for us the extraordinary privileges, the great blessings that are ours in the gospel of Jesus Christ. A magnificent landscape to be looked at that takes our breath away, that moves us profoundly so that we join him in blessing, praising the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then there is the lens in verses 6 through 9. Our privileges are to be a lens to look through. 
Look at your sufferings through the lenses of your privileges so that you interpret them correctly and understand what God is doing, even in your trials, even in your sufferings. So today we come to verses 10 through 12, the third part of this sentence. The burden of Peter's letter of Peter's letter is to equip Christians to live a life on mission together. A life that does not compromise with the world, but at the same time does not retreat from the world. Understanding that the Christian life does involve social exile, marginalisation. After all, Christians are elect exiles of the dispersion. We are cultural outsiders for Jesus' sake. And to live like that, not compromising, not retreating from the world, but being witnesses to the world. With all the costs and sufferings that that entails, we need help. In many ways, verses 10 through 12 remind us of the primary resources that God has given us to fulfil the mission entrusted to us. Verses 10 through 12 teach us to love the Bible. And we're going to work through verses 10 through 12 by noticing that there are three groups of people, or three groups of personages engaging with God's word, responding to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And why I hesitated there was, yes, we have first of all the prophets who search, then secondly, we have the preachers who preach. But then thirdly, we have the angels longing and angels aren't really people. But let's turn to God's word. Um, sacred ground, 1 Peter 1 verses 10 to 12. Can you read along with me? Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. Inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicated, indicating, I beg your pardon, when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. First of all, the prophet's search, verses 10 and 11. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Peter is picturing the writers, the authors of the Old Testament scriptures. The prophets are marvelling, are amazed, are gripped by the message the Spirit of Christ in them was giving them for their generation, pointing them to Jesus, the coming Christ. And they are captivated by this salvation. Back in verse 9, Peter says that we, meaning New Testament believers... 1 Peter 1 verse 9, are now obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This salvation, as the prophets know, will come in a new fullness in the coming of Christ that God had sent them to prophesy. And so they long to know more. So they give themselves to diligent search, to inquiry. They study the scriptures. They compare scripture with scripture. They discuss it. They debate it. They want to understand and penetrate the mystery. The Spirit in Christ in them was predicting the coming Messiah. And they want to know all they can about the fullness of salvation that would one day dawn when Messiah comes. The Old Testament prophets working through the scriptures, trying to understand as much as they can about all that will come with the appearance of the Christ. 
and they did not yet enjoy the fullness of grace. They did not yet penetrate into the fullness of the mystery of the person and the work of Jesus. They did not fully understand. And yet here they are searching diligently the scriptures. Now think about our position, this side of Calvary, this side of the empty tomb. And we know the name of Jesus of Nazareth. We know his words. We know his works. We who are believers in Christ enjoy the benefits of his death, his resurrection. We have been united to him by faith. The spirit of Christ dwells in us. We are heirs of God. We are co-heirs with Christ. Here we are with privileges that are far greater than those enjoyed by the greatest saint of the Old Testament scriptures. And yet for many of us, the only place where we're given direction and help and navigating and living out these rich gospel privileges, which is our Bibles, largely remain shut and unexplored. What comfort and direction we are missing. We harm our own hearts by neglect of the word. Now I suppose one important reason for our often neglect of the Holy Scriptures is that we feel that we do not understand them as we would like. And particularly that is often the case with the Old Testament Scriptures. If you were to ask Peter who wrote the Old Testament, see his answer in verse 11. Yes, the prophets, but it, was, it, but it was the spirit of Christ by the prophets. That is who wrote the Old Testament. The spirit of Christ wrote the Old Testament. And Peter, what is the message of the Old Testament? Peter says to us in verse 11 again, that the Old Testament is about the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. You know that blank page in the middle of your Bible? just after Malachi, just before Matthew. I suspect for me many of us feel like the publisher might well have inserted a sticker there that says something like warning. Behind this page is a bunch of weird stuff. And maybe it is because we think that the Old Testament is mainly about obscure ceremonial law or about the geopolitical misdeeds of ancient Israelite kings, or about mysterious oracles of judgment against pagan nations whose names we can barely pronounce. And so we find ourselves wondering, what has this got to do with me? But I know Peter would say that that is a tragically superficial reading of the Old Testament. What is the Old Testament really about? It is about the sufferings of Christ and the glories to come. The Old Testament pictures Jesus. The whole book speaks of Jesus, do you see? The whole Testament explains Christ's work. The Old Testament makes clear our need of him. The Old Testament exalts in Christ's resurrection. The Old Testament displays Christ's glory. The Old Testament warns of Christ's coming judgment in the law. We see Christ's kingdom foreshadowed to us in every psalm. Christ himself sings to us his lamentation and his praise. In the prophets, Christ is offered to us, proclaimed to us in every genre, genre in, on every page from Genesis to Malachi. The spirit of Christ was speaking of the sufferings of Christ and the glories to come. Peter, remember, wants his listeners to go on mission, to be witnesses, not to retreat, not to compromise, but to be witnesses to Jesus Christ in a dark age. And Peter wants us to be properly equipped for that task. Peter wants us to love the Bible, the whole Bible, and he wants us, when we open it, to meet Christ 
who comes to us on every page. So that is the first thing to gloriously see here, the prophet's search. Secondly, the preacher's message. The matter is the same as the Old Testament prophets. The Bible of the New Testament was preachers, of course, was the Old Testament scriptures. The Christ whom the prophets predicted is the Christ that the preachers proclaimed from the prophetic scriptures. They preach the word from the text of Holy Scripture and the content of their message is Christ himself. This is what Peter says was announced to you, the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories now announced to you by those who preach the good news to you. Now that may seem obvious to us that the New Testament preachers preached Christ. It seems self-evident, but for many contemporary pulpits, that is not at all obvious. Let me give you one frankly ridiculous example. In the news last summer was Norwich Cathedral. There has been a church building on that site for about a thousand years. A magnificent Roman cathedral stands there. And inside the nave of Norwich Cathedral... Last summer they built a helter-skelter, an enormous carnival slide with bells and lights right in the middle of the nave of the cathedral. And they had the bishop slide down it on a, in a Sunday service and he paused halfway down to proclaim to the congregation that God is a tourist attraction before he slid to the bottom amidst the applause and laughter of the congregation. I bring that ridiculous example up to show you what happens when the confidence of the church in the exposition of the word and the proclamation of Jesus Christ is lost. All sorts of nonsense fills the void. Peter says that faithful preaching opens the scriptures, interpreting the old in light of the new, and in every part proclaiming and applying to us Jesus Christ, his sufferings and subsequent glories. That is the character of faithful preaching. Faithful preaching exalts Jesus Christ. Faithful preaching message is Jesus. Peter teaches us that suffering and glory is the normal pattern for every Christian believer. For Peter, one application of the gospel, the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories, is for the comfort of the suffering church. After all, the suffering of Christ and the subsequent glories describe the arc and the trajectory of the normal Christian life that Peter has been, discuss Peter has been discussing earlier in the chapter. So he spoke, for example, about that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there are grievous trials that result, he says, in glory. Or in verse 8, he says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. You're filled with joy that is glorious in its character. Glory is the goal, the outcome of Christian suffering. And Peter says that that is the same pattern that, uh, that obtained in the life of Jesus that now obtains in your Christian life as well. Which is helpful to us when we think, if I must walk the path of suffering, we can also remember that our Saviour has walked it first. And when we wonder, will these trials ever end? Will it ever get back to normal? Will lockdown ever end? We can look at our Saviour's life and remember suffering, then glory. Yes, weeping may last for a night, but joy cometh in the morning.
There is joy, there is joy, there is glory coming. I have been grieved by various trials, if necessary, for a little while, but dawn is on the way. So hold on, suffering Christian. Look to your Saviour. See the arc of his life and experience, suffering and subsequent glories. That will be the arc of your own experience as well. So we thought about the matter of the preacher's sermons. They preach the text of God's word and the message itself, they preached Christ. We've even thought a little bit about the application of that message for the comfort of the suffering church as we see the sufferings of our Saviour and are reminded of glory that will yet come. Uh, before we move on to the last thing, which is the angel's longing, we should notice the preacher's power. If you look at verse 12, Peter says that they preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. These unknown, no-name preachers who led the believers to faith in Christ, to whom Peter was writing, did it as the Apostle Paul puts it, in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. That is what was characteristic of their preaching. Not in persuasive words of human wisdom. It was spirit-illuminated, spirit-enabled. It was convicting and converting power. And that was from the Holy Spirit alone. Where does the power come from to change lives in the ministry of the word. A talking head explained in an ancient book and lives are changed. How does that happen? The answer was the experience of Peter's hearers, readers. It was the experience of the preachers he is speaking about who preached the gospel to them. The word accomplishes how by the spirit sent from heaven. Not cleverness, not artistry, not comedy. How we need to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit attending the preaching of the word. Thirdly, and finally, there is the angel's longing. Do you see that in verse 12? The angels long to look into these things. We are told that the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories become the great preoccupation and cause of wonder for the angelic hosts of heaven. The word for longing, the things into which angels long to look, it means to peer in from the outside. The word that John uses in John 20 verse 5. You remember last week? On the first day of the week after the crucifixion, the women come to the tomb and they find the body is gone and they come back to the disciples and they report what they have found or not found. And Peter and John run to the tomb and John outpaces Peter and we're told in verse 5 and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. That is actually a great description. It is the same language that Peter is using here in our text. It is a great description of the posture of the angels stooping to look in from the outside. You remember, the angels had been there at every point in the earthly ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. The angels were there, thrilling to see the unfolding of the Father's plan and the um, fulfilling of the ancient prophetic words. They were astonished to see the eternal Son, their Lord and Maker, humble himself and take flesh and be joined in human nature in the womb of the Virgin. The angels announced with wonder and with delight the pregnancy of Mary, and then they split the skies in song at the birth of our Saviour. The angels were ministering to Christ in the temptation in the wilderness, and marvelled as the Lord giver himself learned obedience 
through the things that he suffered. And then at the climax of his sufferings, at the height of his agonies on the cross, when darkness covered the earth, the angels are silent as the one who knew no sin was made sin for us. They held their breath, as it were, as they heard him cry, It is finished, and breathed his last. And when the stone rolled away that first Easter Sunday, the angels were there to witness the eternal Son made flesh, now risen from the grave, walk alive from the tomb, bringing life and immortality to light. And then when Jesus ascended into glory and the disciples stood there dumbfounded at the spectacle, the angels were there rebuking them, reminding them that in the same manner in which Christ had left them, he would one day return. At every point, remember, the angels bore witness to the life and ministry of Jesus, but at no point were they the objects of his mission. It was not for them that Jesus came. It was not for them that he obeyed and bled and died and rose and ascended to reign. It is not for them that Jesus is one day soon returning, though they will all come with him on that great day. He came for you. He bled for you. He rose and reigns for you. He is coming back for you. They peer in from the outside, you see, longing to penetrate into the wonder of it all. The angels ask themselves, what must it like to be the recipients of such love? No doubt the angels are first class theologians. It is not that they do not understand the meaning, but their knowledge is only that of a spectator, never of a, that of a participant. They do not know what it is to have sin forgiven. They do not know what it is to be adopted as a child of God. They do not know what it is to have the Spirit of Christ dwell in their hearts, to be sanctified by grace, to stumble and fall and only meet with the patience of a holy God who by his grace picks us up from the dust and dusts us off and empowers us to press on and persevere till we cross the finish line. They do not know what it is, that is like. They never will know what it is like to be swept up at last into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. And so they look down on the least of us, the very least of us. They see us struggling to understand our Bibles. They see us often stumbling, prone to wander. Lord, we feel it. Prone to leave the God we love. And they are amazed because even the least of us knows firsthand what they never could. We taste pardon in mercy. We taste and enjoy adopting love. We are the beneficiaries of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. We have fellowship with the living God and call him Father. Peter has been pressing us to see the enormity of our privileges so that we never take them for granted. Among the most precious privileges entrusted to us is the word of God itself. The prophets searched it out. The preachers proclaimed its message. The angels longed to know. You and I are the objects of the grace conveyed by this book.